Welcome everyone today to today's program sponsored by the Plant Initiative, a call to counsel, a conversation with Maria Teresa Alves and Giovanni Aloy. Um, I'm Paul Moss, the Executive Director of the Plant Initiative, and I'm very excited to introduce Maria Teresa and Giovanni and to start off our one hour program. Uh, Maria Teresa Alves is a Brazilian born American and German installation artist, uh, video artist, activist, filmmaker, and writer who lives in Berlin. Her wide ranging work includes exploring the involvement of plants and other more than humans in, in colonialism, slavery, migration, and global commerce. She was one of the founding members of the Green Party of Sao Paulo, Brazil in 1987. And Maria Teresa has written a number of books, including Seeds of Change, a 20 year investigation into the hidden history of ballast flora displaced plant seeds found in the soil used to balance shipping vessels during the colonial period. She's been recognized with prestigious awards for her art, which has been featured at many exhibitions worldwide. Um, Dr. Giovanni Aloy um, is author, educator, and curator specializing in the representation of nature and the environment in art. He is the editor-in-chief of Antennae, the Journal of Nature and Vis Visual Culture. Alai is the author and, or editor of several books, among them, Why Look at Plants, The Vegetal Emergence in Contemporary Art, and most recently, Vegetal Entwinements in Philosophy and Art and Estado Vegetal, Performance and Plant Thinking. Alai has contributed to BBC Radio, PBS TV, worked at the Whitechapel Art Gallery and Tate Galleries in London, and is currently a USA correspondent for S Magazine. He is also a board member of the Plant Initiative. So the program will start with Maria Teresa and Giovanni going through a few examples of her works in an informal way and a brief conversation between the two of them. Then for the remainder of the program, Maria Teresa will be responding to questions posed by you, the attendees, that will be presented by Giovanni as selected by questions that are posted in the Zoom chat. So we encourage you to suggest a question or more for Maria Teresa to discuss by posting it in the chat, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. And the program will be recorded and posted online on the Plant Initiative's YouTube channel. And a link to the recording will be sent to everyone who registered. With that, I'm turning over the program to Giovanni. Thank you so much, Paul. It's such a pleasure to be here with a true pioneer of what today we call critical plant studies and plants in art, Maria Theresa Alves. And uh, Maria Theresa is gonna take us through some of her most thought provoking and, and challenging works. And we're just gonna explore uh, ethical, political and representative um, issues in the work of plants and collaborations uh, between plants and art. Maria Teresa, would you like to uh, begin? Yes, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Giovanni, for the invitation to speak at Plant Initiative. I will talk on three works, maybe four, made in the last 15 years. Uh, although one of my earliest works was an installation on the forest titled, No Soy Su Madre, I Am Not Your Mother, made in 1990 in Mexico. So we will begin with an image of the work that sometime is called Bougainvillea. It has two titles. Um, this is a work that is comprised of five watercolors made in 2009. It's a result of um, a stay in Senegal where for several weeks I was there as an artist in resident. It was one of the most important residencies for my practice as an artist. Among the works produced was Deo Teo de Ep, uh, which for me is seminal, and you can find information on uh, that work on my website. Um, I will concentrate on other works today. But on the last day, uh, we were taken from Joao Fayut, where our artist in res residency was, to Dakar. And there we went to the island of Gore, a fort where enslaved Africans would be forced into ships to be sold in the Americas. We were surrounded by harsh artifacts of this history, but in the midst of which a busy life for locals continued. As we sat in a cafe, a fellow artist mentioned how many spectacular women there were. 
it looked like a fashion magazine, magazine photography shoot. There was the bougainvillea sprawling over walls or standing as bushes growing throughout the island. They are endemic to Brazil, which was the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery. That was in, in 1888. So when I was a teenager, I met people who had been enslaved and one whose parents owned people. He was the director of a prestigious library and declared that things were better then, quote, when they were, when everyone knew their place, unquote. That is a comment for some, for, from someone who had a nice place. Following European colonial practice, the Bougainvillea was named after a European, a French ship captain. Although this fort had originally been Portuguese, with yet another colonization, it was passed on to the French. And it was the commander at this fort who would choose from the enslaved women awaiting the prison ships, those who were to remain there for him. In Brazil, I believe it was during the administration of President Lula, his first administration, he's on his third, that the anti-slavery task force was created. In 2008, 4,634 enslaved people were freed. Under former President Bolsonaro, it was deactivated, this task force, and now under Lula again, measures are being taken against slavery. I was once asked, um, what did I mean by uh, this slavery in Brazil? Was it low wages? No, it's not low wages. It is no wages and imprisonment in usually uh, large properties in inaccessible places. Um, and uh, your, we, in Brazil, there is a, a workbook. I don't know what you would call it in the US. It's a labor book and all your jobs and all the salaries you received are noted on it. So then your pension would be figured out on it. And you, um, when you end up being in these uh, situations, the overseer takes your workbook. So therefore all the proof of uh, the pension monies you're supposed to be receiving is held by them. Uh, I'm sure now maybe on the digital possibilities, things have changed. Um, the long text that you see, there's two similar long texts after the Bougainvillea, uh, also mentions the lack of indigenous artists in the Sao Paulo Biennale. But recently, very recently, that has changed and brings much needed knowledges and cosmologies into what had been a very, very narrow concept of art in Brazil. The Bougainvillea witnesses the slave trade and colonial practices, which continues in the Americas today. Giovanni mentions, we, we had a discussion earlier, and he mentions that the term witness plants can be useful for certain forms of projection. Uh, but as witness, uh, there is conscious required. And thus he reminds us not to anthropomorphize uh, flora and plants, but rather engage them as multi-species collaborators. Giovanni, would you like to discuss now maybe do you have a question or two? Yes, um, it's, it's very interesting work to me. It's very touching and subtle. And one of the aspects that I am perhaps more interested in, in relation to the co-creation between you and the plant in, this, in the context of this exhibition is in relation to symbolism and how plants have been used in the past, of course, by nations especially, as symbols and emblems of power or histories. And in this case, I think you do something very different by mobilizing this very notion of witnessing that I find uh, touching, poetic, uh, very open. And also, you know, with this question of, um, a question of awareness, a question of how can a plant witness I think takes us into a territory of reconsidering plant agency that I also find interesting in the context of this bridging of past and present, histories that are difficult for us to negotiate and comprehend. And I think in that context, in this um, poetic tapestry that you weave, that has threads that are particularly hard to uh, accept and and sort of handle 
there is something fascinating about your own representation. You decided not to use a photograph of the flower, but to engage in a representational form that in a sense, at times echoes the tradition of botanical illustration, but to me also seems to go somewhere else in a different place that brings back this notion of witnessing, this poetic dimension that you have engaged with. Uh, you know, but, but before you get started, Maria Teresa, I, Jim, I wonder if it's possible to put this in presenter view so that it will cover more of the screen because we're we're getting some comments that that uh, people can't see the whole thing. So just be that. There like you this? go. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that, does that work better, Aaron? Thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry to interrupt. Okay, thank you, Giovanni. Um, yes, with the, the watercolors, um, I've been trying to work between um, what I appreciate about uh, making the watercolors is the attention I must spend on looking at the plant mm -hmm. um, and the, the details. Uh, and so right now, for example, in Naples, uh, I'm, uh, I'm having lessons of the local flora. And um, as I'm not from the area, it's very difficult for me to understand, uh, especially when the plants are very young, which plants they're growing to, into being. Mm -hmm. And uh, by doing the watercolors uh, and looking at very small details that I am not um, trained to do, but the botanist is training me, I can be more appreciative of understanding um, uh, all the complexities of making one different from the other for very specific situations. So that has been um, important for uh, being able to understand why perhaps a plant is growing in one place and not another, mm -hmm. because it's finding a niche that another plant can't, and, it's, and it grows with certain aspects that um, allow that to happen. So uh, it's been a very slow process because it's not, not anything I was actually trained in, but I continue. Thank you. And uh, out of curiosity, again, for this representational strategy that you've decided to deploy in this case, Bougainville is known for the cluster of flowers, right? It's very um, generous uh, blooming plant. And I was wondering instead why you decided to single out an individual bloom rather than a more spectacular or sublime cluster as as it's usually done. Thank you for that question. Um, actually, I did two drawings. <laughs> and the first one had, uh, I don't remember now, but something like three or four flowers. Uh, but I didn't, I, I, I looked at it for quite a while and it didn't work for me uh, because it was becoming um, not about the flower, and the plant it was becoming about an arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why I, I redid it and I only wanted one flower. Uh, that's very interesting. I understand. I, I think what you do with your illustration very much straddles bravely that um, disciplinary line, right? It's, is it botanical illustration and it follows a certain, lab, uh, a certain uh, set of rules, aesthetics, or by tampering with those aesthetics, can we even flirt with a um, an anthropomorphism, perhaps? I keep seeing a face, in a sense, and I know that we're hardwired to see faces wherever we look, uh, but the individualization of the bloom, the way you positioned it as well, looking back, it almost stares back at the viewer. I think that's something really interesting there within the context of this intimate tapestry that connects different time periods and different realities. But we can move to the next work, of course, because there's so much more to see. But the face wasn't intentional. <laughs> right, I, I kind of assume so, but it sort of looks at the, at the viewer, right? Yes, it does, yes, I agree. Um, this one is decolon Decolonizing Botany. And to survive winter days in Berlin, I sometimes go to the tropical house of the botanical garden and accept the comfort offered by ferns and a manufactured waterfall. And there is a section of the greenhouse dedicated to the Atlantic forest where I'm from. And plants are named after Europeans, such as Johannen Wolfgang von Goethe, 
the writer and scientist from Germany. Mostly uh, they're named after men or their descendants in uh, the Americas. For example, from Brazil, we have uh, a plant named after Burl Marx, the landscape architect, who, although from the, uh, he's originally from the Atlantic uh, forest area, came only to notice the plants from there while in Berlin, uh, when he was a young man, visiting the same greenhouse that I was in. Uh, there are now over 50 plants honoring him. Uh, he's very important in the discourse of uh, modernism in Brazil for introducing the concept that perhaps uh, local endemic plants um, need to be looked at instead of doing gardens based on European roses, which was quite common at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm curious to know how many uh, plants might be uh, with names honoring frontline activists whose actual work ensures, sometimes at the cost of their lives, the survival of the Atlantic forest, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there are any, maybe there, there might be. Uh, in the botanical gardens there in Berlin, but in many, uh, most plants I notice are planted far from each other. And then thus there's little interaction between plants, uh, unless for example, they're vines because then they have to be planted on uh, a tree. And this I find uh, disturbing. Uh, they stand as species in quotes, uh, instead of li uh, as live beings. And so this is something that uh, would be interesting um, to speak to botanical gardens to, to see if this is possible to address. I already spoken to the botanical gardens in Berlin. It's very difficult for things to change there. Um, and colonization is, uh, as we know in the Americas, a forever process making event of theft of land, resources, bodies, beings, and culture. The settler taking possession in this case of the Americas requires renaming to consolidate the desired obliteration of the indigenous. The use of Western scientific nomenclature is part of this desire. Decolonizing botany was made in 2020, and it is an attempt to engage the visitor with the complexity of Guarani thought and the importance of relationality to other beings and their surroundings. Uh, the Guarani territory covers the Atlantic forest area, more or less, plus it covers another one, but uh, it covers the area on the east coast of Brazil below the state of Espiritu Santo. The work consists of about 24, not of about, it does consist of 24 watercolors. I'm very bad at numbers, so I've learned to put about everywhere, so, um, I can leave some wiggle room when I make mistakes. Um, and there are also 24 accompanying audios organized and or sung by K.U. Rusu Katupere and Vere Pote Zezarezaka of the Jeguareu Reservation of the Guarani and Kayawa peoples in Dorados, Mato Grosso do Sul. In the installation, one song name is audible at a time. It is not organized sequentially, and so one meanders to hear from one to the other song name. The work was purchased by Madre Museum in Naples, and one third of the monies, as the gallery was also involved, was for the community. I would like to read part of the statement by, made by Catupere and Rezacan. So this is a quote from their statement. In respect, when we enter the forest, we first ask permission. In respect, we consider every plant a being that in the past was good and their beauty and chance will heal people. The names of the plants come to us. We gather in the evening as a community and they tell us their names, usually in the song. So there is respect in everything for earth and life and for being a plant. Um, that's the end of the quote. Now I will show you uh, images of four plants we're not able to um, put audio because it's not working uh, with the setup. I, uh, on my website, there are, are some audios available. Uh, this first one, uh, the translation from the Guarani, 
is in English is one day you will see me in white. The next one. This one, the translation in English is even though I am far away or don't see myself, I remember my song. This one is in English, my leaves cover my tears of sorrows, but they are admired by the other plants. This one, I have water, but am fragile. I have spirit. You can leave that image uh, because I don't have images for the next one, but any, uh, to continue with this one. During a talk at the Botanical Gardens in Naples about this work, Paulo Caputo, the director, noted that these names in Guarani are from the point of view of the plants. And he said, Western Norman cal cal uh, naming takes the point of view of the scientist. Uh, Giovanni has pointed out the importance of a collective of flora and people, a co-becoming. Perhaps we can begin by listening to plants in the quiet of the night. There's something really beautiful, Maria Theresa, about the uh, question of decolonizing and how you decided to include sound for this process to take place. Because I think we've we've discussed decolonization a lot over the past 10 years. And what I realize as I travel around the world is that different countries understand different processes of decolonization and different priorities related to decolonizing in very different ways. And going back to the institutional rigidity that you have mentioned earlier, like it's difficult in a botanic garden to alter a structure that is not just a planting solution, but it actually is emblematic of a broader structural conception of order that we have imposed in the West on the natural world. How to decolonize through institutions that are affected by that rigidity in ways that seem impossible to undo and, and transgress these structures, perhaps sometimes using other media like sound, which are not necessarily the sound, the traditional sound of the study of, sorry, the traditional medium of the sound of, of this uh, subject of botany in the tradition of the West. So I think to me, the introduction of sound um, is just as equally powerful as the renaming aspect that you've operated. And what's striking about the renaming to me is that the new names are really no not names in, in a Western conception. They are manifestations of a character, a moment, and they remain elusive. I was as you as you mentioned the names of, of these these flowers, I wondered what would happen to taxonomy if those names were adopted um, instead of the ones that we use that follow the Linnaean um, structure. But then again, maybe decolonization is not a matter of completely erasing, but it's a matter of enriching and it's a matter of adding or replacing, you know, like which one should come first in when we look at a book uh, of plants from a specific area, maybe the uh, the Latin name should come after the name that the locals, but it should still be there to help us navigate a complex world. I don't know, what do you think? Uh, I agree with that. And this was a work that I did that was before decolonizing botany. It was a work called, you will go away one day, but I will not. And that mm -hmm. was one of the name songs of a, of a plant. Uh, I did it with Lucrecia Dalton. And it was a beautiful work. Uh, she's a composer and it was part of a, a festival in Berlin uh, where the organizers put one composer with one artist. So Lucrecia and I did not know each other and, um, and a place. And our place was the Botanical Garden, which I knew very well. And uh, we started to map out the garden in different ways. And I um, 
um, I wanted to work just on the Atlantic forest area of, uh, section because that's where, where I'm from. So I can uh, understand a little bit how to move around that situation. And what we did there is we put uh, pink uh, information panels, similar to the green uh, panels that the Botanical Gardens has with the Latin name of the plant. Um, and we put it in, in pink. And that was my part of the work, uh, along with um, um, involving the Guarani community with the songs. And uh, the panels had uh, the names in Guarani, and then the translation in uh, English and German, and then the, uh, the botanical name, the Western botanical name. And then at the end of this work, there was a talk at the Botanical Gardens and I expressed a desire uh, to leave the work there in exchange for four, pa four uh, passes a year to bring friends. So it, was a, it would be a very inexpensive artwork that they would have uh, received. Acquired, yeah. yeah, acquired. And um, they said no, because it would be too confusing to the visitors. And I was astonished. Um, at this because it was pink, it was bright pink. It was very different from, and you could, and there were only two doors coming into the space. You could easily put another bright pink panel informing that this is an artwork, but it was just this lack of um, wanting to participate in another way of, um, as you said, enriching knowledge. Yeah, and to be honest with you, I don't want to um, go down a spiral of, criticism of institutions, but artists such as yourself and, you know, as a creative individual myself who has worked with institutions like botanic gardens and natural history museums for many years, I'm always very often confronted with a rigidity um, that perhaps shouldn't be there when the institution has a desire to work with an artist. And to me, by essence, that desire to work with an artist should be seen as uh, a request for a cross-pollination, a multidisciplinary cross-pollination that is designed to ultimately change the methods and processes of that institution in the long run. Yeah. I, I don't believe that the contribution an artist makes to a botanic garden should just be seen as this milieu that arrives and disappears. Otherwise, that's a little bit too limiting, too self-contained. But I wonder, and I'm sure there are other artists in the audience who feel that way too, this, these negotiations between what can be done when we push the boundaries within these institutions needs to be treated differently. I think there needs to be um, more openness and also trust in the audience. In my experience, more than once, I noticed that institutions working with plants seem to sell their visitors short in terms of what they might want to see, what they might want to engage, what they might want to learn from an exhibit. And, and sometimes there's a, a too easy reversal on the idea that beauty is what visitors to botanic gardens uh, ultimately come there for. But I, I find that very problematic and very difficult when especially artists such as yourself who have developed such a critical um, practice, you know, when it's obvious that you're going to want to unsettle something, that you're going to evidence or, or propose a change. It's, it's, it comes with you, it comes with the territory, I think. Yeah. Yes, we hope that in the future, one always has hope for the future, otherwise <laughs> we become cynics. Uh, that there might be more openness uh, for the next artist that does a work at the Botanical Gardens in Berlin. Right, yes. And back to your wonderful watercolors. Uh, I just can't help but admire your the delicacy and your chosen aesthetic. Like in this case too, I noticed that you seem to deliberately um, distance yourself just enough from botanical illustration of the canonical kind, the scientific kind, so to allow a sense of openness, but you still want to sketch out the plant 
or let's say enough of the attributes of this plant so that it's recognizable. And I feel like that recognition, because it's left open to a certain degree, allows for recognition of the species, but also a recognition of the individual plant that you drew. Am I onto something there? Yes. Um, because I really do pay attention to one very specific plant mm -hmm. and, um, and try to look at all the small elements as, as much as I can. Um, sometimes I miss situations because I don't know what I am looking um, at and the botanist in Naples is uh, teaching me how to look better and I'm thankful for that. Um, but yes, there has to be still the spirit of the plant there. Um, it cannot become a, only a species. There has to be a, a living being with specificity. Yeah, it definitely shines through. There's definitely um, your treatment of details and surfaces and nuances is, is really allowing that. And I find that very complicated because we're also haunted by the canonical representations of plants that botany has passed down to us. They're beautiful. And yet, very easily, oftentimes, they just objectify the plant for scientific purposes, which is not a negative thing uh, in itself. But it leads itself to taxonomy. It leads itself to ar the archival processes of botany rather than developing new and, and more nuanced understandings of our relationship with plants. I agree. Thank you. And um, we have, of course, there's uh, another incredibly important work in the um, career of Maria Teresa Alves. Um, uh, Giovanni, a... uh, I was going to speak about the Council of Beings. Oh, of course. Yes. If we can just leave it back on that previous huh? image. Okay. Please go ahead and then we'll move on to that. Sorry. Um, I have no images of the work Council of Beings uh, as it is in process for, uh, for a baking uh, for an exhibit titled Mutual Aid, Art in Collaboration with Nature that will be at the Castello di Rivoli near Turin, Italy, and which opens in the end of October. But I wanted to discuss a little bit the process um, because it was an important uh, uh, development. So I would like to talk about it. Jacqueline Martins invited me to a solo exhibit at her gallery in Sao Paulo in 2021. She asked if I would like to reflect on the upcoming presidential elections with the candidates Lula and the incumbent Bolsonaro. I had been a representative of the Workers' Party in about 1980, uh, which Lula among others had founded and later a founding member of the Green Party of Sao Paulo. At this new request by Jacqueline, I reflected on the necessary and urgent situations we all find ourselves in now. In democratic societies, by participating in our voting system, we are acknowledging that we are active agents in deciding how our society, our lives will be. However, in this democratic act, a parallel society has been and continues to be excluded all the beings who co-inhabit our worldly ecology, as Malcolm 39 says. The climate change crisis has ex exposed the prioritization of humans over the other than human, and a disconcerting lack of concern for these beings. Bring, for example, in Brazil, we have alarming droughts and fires in the Amazon. I propose a council of beings, which would include all beings in a neighborhood, for example. If the well being of the other than humans in the community are not being fulfilled, then the humans are not allowed to vote. In Brazil, this would also result in a loss of bank accounts, passport, fines, uh, et cetera, because in Brazil it is mandatory to vote in elections. I have just returned from a research trip in the Piedmont in the UNESCO protected wine growing region. It would be interesting if UNESCO was to extend the protection also to all the beings that co-inhabit this region. In this region today, use of pesticides and herbicides in non-bio and natural wineries has resulted in destruction to co-inhabitants who are other than human. 
Only at the edges of these fields is there a spontaneous growth of meadow plants and flowers, giving life to bees, butterflies, and others. On the other hand, if the winery does not use chemicals, then there is a plethora of flora under and alongside each grapevine, as well as on the edges. Among the members of the Council of Beings for Piedmont, whom I propose as a beginning, and I will here use the Latin names, um, are Tragopogon dubius, a plant, Parus major, a bird, Bombus, te Bombus terrestris, a bee, Rhinolophus ferum equinium, a bat, Columbola, a soil my microorganism, Pordasis siculus, a lizard, the, a hill being, there, the area is full of hills, and there is the other than human collaborations, which jo Giovanni has mentioned in the past, and in this case of time and oregano beings. Their collaboration is necessary in the reproduction of the Fengaris arion butterfly, along with the necessary participation also of the ant being, Mirmica saboletti. If one of these beings are not present, the, continu the continuation of life of Fengaris arion becomes threatened. And thus in the council of beings in Piedmont, you as a human, will not be able to vote. It's a very interesting proposition. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the form the exhibition will take? In uh, terms of media? Yeah, it will be watercolors, like in a council, uh, you have portraits of the council members. No? So it'll be watercolors of these uh, council members. And um, I also will be developing an outdoor work and it will be the first time I'm developing an outdoor work uh, on a larger scale with, uh, because in Brazil I did very small uh, outdoor works and this will be a larger scale. And I'm in the process of developing so I don't quite know where it's going. So next year I can have better uh, information on that. Wonderful. It sounds I, I totally agree with the with the principle that you're you're mapping here because I really feel that for as much as so much has happened in uh, conversations in the arts as well as politics and science about ecology and climate change, I still have the impression that the change required in our minds for long lasting, for a long lasting difference is so much more radical. And it does entail re-educating ourselves to put nature first. And what that means, like put nature first, might entail even like radical actions of the kind that you're outlining. Um, because we've really lost that priority. Nature has become, as we all know, this accessory, this optional that you can or cannot be interested in, and that's okay. Um, I personally would advocate for redesigning completely primary school and secondary school programs to put nature first as the foundation of all learning that follows. It's a long road, but artists such as yourself who have a foot in the legislation and political dimension of thing, things and the other in the gallery space or museum, really inspire me to think about possibilities here. They don't make me, you, you know, like artists like you that really encompass these broad fields and connect the two, I think offers opportunities to feel empowered, to find ways to do the same. Okay, first we have to change the UNESCO program, okay? <laughs> yes. If there's somebody in the audience that is good at these things, please contact yeah. me. First step. No. You mentioned working outdoors is going to be one of the challenges uh, or exciting propositions that you're going to face with this exhibition. But you have experience in working outdoors, of course, with plants. And um, Seeds of Change is, is one of the most complex and uh, rich works, I think, that you have constantly evolved over the past 20 years. It has different iterations around the world in the gallery space, outdoors. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how this idea came about and why 
it defined your career so much? Um, I was at a congress, uh, uh, no, a conference in uh, Finland around 1997 or so. And um, it was organized by a scientist and a curator. And it was uh, between scientists and artists. It was one of these early attempts. And it was an amazing uh, conference. And I saw a tool of a botanist and it was a tool for sampling earth, very small tool, uh, the height of my hand and the thickness of a thumb. And uh, she sampled uh, earth and I wanted to know more about it. And the curator gave me her PhD thesis and it was on uh, ballast flora. Of course, I never heard of ballast flora. And um, uh, she was had been working in Treposari and uh, had stumbled upon many plants that were not local plants. So she talked to her professor, said, I've looked at the flora of Finland, I cannot identify them. He said, because these uh, plants are not from Finland. And then she started to try to understand how did these plants get there? And they came by a ship because it was one of, Eriposari no longer is, but was one of the most important ports in Finland. Um, so I got very excited and decided I wanted to study ballast flora because to me it was like, these plants arrive and there are his, everybody in the Posari, to, um, to them, the history of the port has become a little bit in the past, but the flora that grows all over the island uh, is a testimony to all the different trade routes that the Posari had been involved in. So I got very excited about these um, like hidden histories that would come out with these um, witness plants. So I started to work in uh, Marseille. I called up uh, Ellie Butila, the botanist, and asked if she could uh, mentor me because I didn't know how to be so precise with plants in a scientific study. And I began, I first checked to make sure that there were no uh, ballast flora studies in Marseille because I didn't want to duplicate uh, scientific work in the art context. I wanted to make new uh, scientific work. And um, so I did it in Marseille. And then the curator in um, Finland asked me to do uh, a similar uh, work in Treposari. Um, and I said, I cannot because a work was already done there. And there, therefore, as an artist, I would just be aestheticizing the scientific accomplishment of the botanist. Right. And she asked if I, if I could meet with the botanist. So we had a Zoom meeting or no, not a Zoom meeting, whatever that was, that was called in those days. And um, she explained that she had not been able due to time constraints to meet with uh, residents and so could not take any samples on private property. She only took samples in public areas. And if I could do that, that would be helpful to the study. And I was able to do that. And therefore it turned out that it expanded the study and um, she generously uh, put my name in a co-authored scientific bot botanical study on ballast flora. Um, so it was this expansion of all the situation. I should perhaps pause here uh, to explain that ballast flora is um, used, uh, Paul mentioned it earlier, it's material, usually earth or rock, sand, whatever is cheap, put in a ship to balance the ship when um, such material was needed um, in different trade routes. For example, if you bought silk in China, the ship would be too light, so you need to put a lot of ballast. Later, I would find out, much later, I'd find out when you have people on board, you need a lot of ballast also. So um, these ballast are not just of the port uh, where the merchandise was introduced, because you don't know how the ballast got there also. So it could have been a more complicated history from another ship that had arrived and deballasted, and then this new ship came and reballasted. Um, ballast uh, has been going on, solid ballast is what I study, has been going on until about the 19-teens, uh, except in New York, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'll come back to here. I also did uh, Bristol, uh, Thompson Exeter, Dunkirk, uh, Liverpool, Antwerp, and then New York. Uh, the one you're seeing the image is a floating ballast garden in Bristol. 
And this was several years after I did uh, the original Seeds of Change. And it was commissioned by Aldo Rinaldi, who was, I believe, cultural secretary of the Bristol Council. And um, he was able to get funding for a five-year program from 2012 to 2016 uh, with the support of the Botanical Gardens who uh, took care of all of the, fl of the flora there. And um, there was a program inviting scientists, writers, poets, artists, musicians, um, storytellers, many, many different people. Each year uh, during the summer, spring, summer, fall at time, there was this very rich program. In 2006 was 16, we knew there would be the, it would be the end of the funding. And the last planting was for a pollinating uh, garden for bees. So we left it as a pollinating garden for bees. And there is, uh, we have a few more images as well would like to show of the different iterations of Seeds of Change. And I think it might be time for- um... Switching to the questions. Yeah, yeah from uh, our audience. Correct, Paul? Uh, yeah, we actually have a number of questions. Uh, so it's interesting topics that have been put out there. So that would be great if you might select uh, one or more, Giovanni. Sure. Um, or if anyone is willing, of course, to um, talk, you can ask question your, questions yourself. Um, let's see. So question on decolonization of plant names, would it be best to rename plants after different human, example activists as suggested earlier, or after their own attributes as plants? And if so, what kind of attrib attributes? What name do you think would be best, would best replace Bougainvillea? Um... I had said activist because I was in the situation of being these are those questions that are, it's a question that formulates an answer, whereas the question actually, the answer is more long-term. So to answer the question in the short term, um, I was in the botanical gardens when I suggested that because it was in a confrontation uh, during a, a, a round table talk. And so that was my quick response to um, the situation. Um, I. I would think it would be more interesting as an attribute uh, of the plant. And this is already something that's happening. I read about two or three months ago. Uh, so it's wonderful that there, that there are some people that are being able to have some uh, um, way of being able to talk to botanical gardens about this. Um, so that would be interesting. But what I think is the attribute, I. I think it is something that I think other people that have more uh, an eye of looking could have form of consensus. And maybe it would be very interesting to form a consensus in uh, with community members that have a much more long-term relationship with these beings. Um, so that would be the path I think that would be more interesting. Yeah, that's very, um, very interesting there, Marie Theresa. I think the consensus will be the challenge, right? <laughs> Outside a, a clear or defined uh, disciplinary boundary. Um, Sarah Gabriel, this is wonderful. I have a deep decolonization wordsmith suggestion. How about we start referring to other than human or more than human or non-human simply as other kin? The former phrase, keep humans at the center. What do you think about this? That is a wonderful suggestion. Um, I've, I've loved that suggestion when I've seen it in um, the writings of uh, different uh, thinkers. It's just that I live in Europe and the word kin is very difficult uh, for people to understand what it might mean. So I um, try to keep a, a vocabulary that uh, takes into consideration uh, 
the English, that's a, a language that's used by many people, but can, it, it, that's not a word that many of my friends would know what it meant. Yeah. Yeah, I agree <laughs> with you, Marie Theresa, but it's a very valid point and an urgent one. I was just talking about this to my students um, last week. And in the context of a curation of an exhibition here that I did here in Chicago, my co-curator Andy Yang and I decided to use earthlings to avoid the other or none. But, you know, I think that's an area of mapping. Yeah, no, I agree. I have a, a very hard time that the word human keeps popping up in all these other possibilities. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. It's just, and I, I think other kin is a, a wonderful uh, option. It's just that it, 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 we have to find an, yet another one that is more understandable. Yeah. And uh, we have a question by Stephen White. Some years ago, I was talking with a friend who teaches at the University of Sao Paulo and who was instrumental in organizing the initial presidential campaign of Lula in Brazil. When our conversation turned to measures that could be taken to protect the Amazonian rainforest, my friend grew very angry with me and told me that Brazil had the right to develop the rainforest as a national resource, and that he was offended by the idea that the rainforest needed to be turned into a giant botanical garden for people from Europe and the United States. Has um, the thinking of the Lula's Workers' Party evolved in recent years with regard to protection of the rainforest? Um, it, let's say, it's better than under Bolsonaro, um, but there's much, much work to be done. There were uh, difficulties when there was that um, hydroelectric power plant made that caused much damage. And that was done under Lula's government. Uh, there is a problem um, with the, the, I think the, the, what do you, the, the foundation, let's say the, the base of the Workers' Party. And that's one of the reasons um, I left. Uh, it still has the thinking uh, prevalent of that to develop is progress, you know? Um, and so that is the base of the party. And um, so it's extremely problematic. And I've encountered that also in Mexico when I stayed there. And so, that is the base and we have to spend, I don't know how many more years having a discussion that development is not being very helpful at this situation, um, but they will, um, that sector of society, which is a large sector still views um, the, the Amazon, the Atlantic forest as places for future development of the economic potential, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know that discourse. So that is a, a ground problem. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's certainly like an extractivist issue, right? Yep. Yep. I, th I think that there is a, a, an interesting question yet about naming. Naming really stood out, I think, as part of this decolonizing project from Ken Ronaldo. Hello, Ken. Could we not name plants after their symbiotic relationships with other insects or animal species they have co-evolved with? I, I, um, once I was working with the, um, the Piedmont bees and find out, uh, found out about this incredibly complex relationship with the butterfly and thyme and oregano and the ant, I was, I was so amazed in that. And um, I, would like to work further on that. I think the next uh, works I will make will be on these complexities. And I would like to really um, see how far it goes, but not that it becomes so much that it devolves into everything is connected to everything kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm very interested in these very uh, detailed specificities um, that uh, one doesn't acknowledge and um, with so many thousands of years of history to be to have formed, and it would be uh, amazing if we could figure out ways to be celebratory of that. Yes, it would be beautiful. And Paul, I don't know if we have any more time for a quick question. Yeah, we 
we have uh, about five more minutes. So I just need about a minute for myself to wrap up. So you have, could probably take another question or so if or comment if there is one. I don't see a new one in the um, chat, but I know having spoken to Maria Theresa before that there's also a domestic dimension of potted plants uh, in Maria Theresa's life. So I just wanted to know if you could tell us something about what they mean to you within this more intimate dimension. How do you spend time with your plants and how they inform your, your life, how they enrich your life um, every day? Okay, uh, in Berlin, I have uh, two because the apartment I have it has very, very little light and there's just one window and that's two of them we have grown and taken it over. So I cannot accept guests from other friends who don't have a green thumb and would like me to take care of it because there's just not enough space. Uh, but in Naples, um, I have um, uh, many co-inhabitants on the two terraces and they began to be there right in the beginning when we started, as soon as the house was a little bit ready, we started to uh, uh, get earth and um, large pots and we first got some earth donated to us by a friend who was making his house in the um, Vesuvius, where is this rich earth and he gave us the earth and first we just planted the earth because we know that that area is very rich and we wanted to see everything that came up. And uh, unfortunately we went away and a friend took care of the plants and then thought they were weeds and just cut them. Uh, and then I made a new work um, based on that called Wild Flora. Um, but uh, then I ha we had ended up buying normal plants that you can, can buy in a, in a greenhouse. And, uh, but some guests arrived unexpectedly an apricot seed arrived, don't know how, probably a bird and has grown into a very large tree. It gave, uh, for the first time it's been flowers and we kept planting more and more. And then I thought we had too many because it takes quite a while to water them. And I asked Jimmy Durham, my partner, I said, you know, there's, there's a lot of plants and it, it takes us like two to three waters during two to three hours during the summer to, um, fulfill their needs he said but we are making life there was no life here and um so it's um a duty i take very seriously and um now birds have started to come a little bit uh, of course we have lizards and um, bees are very happy with the basil and other plants and trying to get more plants for bees um so it begins my day it's part of my afternoon and it's part of my evenings I think it's a wonderful thought, you know, like sometimes I feel conflicted when I spend far too much time in the garden watering or pruning and tidying up and just taking, making sure that there's space for other creatures to enjoy the garden too. And we're making life, right? So it's not, it takes time and, and so it should be. Uh, can I ask before we leave if somebody can send me the questions from the chat because I don't know how to save them. Um, just sure, <laughs> sure. I'll do. I'll do that. Thank you. I'll be happy to send them to you. Well, well, well thank you. I just want to thank both both of you, Maria Teresa and Giovanni, so much for such an interesting and wide ranging conversation today. And also thanks to the audience members for your for your questions. Um, this program has been one of a series of online events about the human plant connection. Uh, and we're planning two additional programs this year with the next being held on October 22nd with Stephen F. White and Jill Flukeber talking about their microcosms project. And on November 20th with Dakota author, Diane Wilson in conversation about her book, The Seed Keeper. We hope that you'll join us for those events as well. So thank you again for attending today. And if you would like to support these types of programs from the Plant Initiative, we're always appreciation, appreciative of donations through our website at plantinitiative.org. Well, well, thanks so much, everyone. And uh, um, thanks for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you, Maria Theresa. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.